don't know if he's going to go into it. I know he's worked on about 20 years. Right. How long have been on this? About 20 years? Uh, that's there about 2000. 16 years. I, he didn't just, this is not something that just came up three, three, day, three years ago. Right. 16 years he's been working on this. All right, analysis. And it's finally come to fruition. And so you're going to see everything. I hope you're going to really get to show all, all of the research. It's going, to be, it's going to be fascinating. I can't wait to see it. Okay, so uh, really the thing that got me about this method is this, is like I had no clue. He's going to talk about the first engine, the second engine, which you can correct me if I'm still right. The first engine, I had no clue what it was, and I finally figured it out. The axis, I want to take away to us, is this movement here, I'm not, I'm not doing it very well, but this here is so freaking key, it's so freaking important. I mean, I can't. I never did that. I would just like like this, I just want like it like this, right? And that's like the amateurs do instead of boom. And you'll see he's gonna talk about looking using like that, right? Show this, this is the first engine, right? It's the second engine. Second engine, I reverse it, second engine, second engine, I reverse it. I've worked with this this week. Uh, it's difficult to understand at first, but when you understand it, it's really easy to do. Okay, so you're gonna if you're going to spend time trying to develop the swing, why not develop the swing that Barry and Manny and A-Rod and, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the greats that they got. I think Ron wants me to show you this. <coughs> this is my beginning. <laughs> okay? That's Ryan Howard. That's me on the right. And I'm trying to duplicate Ryan Howard in my basement. I'm possessed, I've got two sons, both of them behind their age group in their ability, and we're trying to catch up, and I'm trying to learn the swing, and I'm possessed, I'm a dad possessed to help his kids. So, as you can see in this one, Brian Howard is swinging down to the ball, but his barrel goes up through the ball, and I'm trying to duplicate it, and I'm going down to the ball and down through the ball, okay? That swing plane difference is huge. Um, and we'll get into that a lot, but that, that video is just to show a little bit of what I did to, to learn what I learned. Here's me trying to imitate Jim Edmonds, good Cardinal, great player. Um, I'm starting to learn a few things, but I'm still pretty much down to, down through. Jim's down to and up through. And then I start to figure a few things out. This is just a one-hand swing by, by me, but I watch my barrel path in relation to my body compared to Bonds' barrel path in relation to his body. Okay? The importance here, the importance here is that there's depth of the barrel back here. There's barrel speed behind you. Okay? And that was what I first noticed when I started my quest is these guys' barrel is blurring out back here behind them. It's not blurring out out here, it's blurring out back there. And that blur in the video represents speed. So somehow or another, they are generating some speed behind them. And I, I couldn't do it with that. I couldn't do it pulling with my arm. I couldn't do it pushing with my top hand. So the very first thing I discovered, and Ron alluded to it, is this action here has to be happening somehow to get this barrel to have speed behind them. Okay? Well, it, it's not a totally weak feeling, but it's not enough, okay? But I sold out to that, and I tried to figure out how they were doing that. So, the first thing I just, I call that the hand pivot point. The, uh, here's a good example. And he's turning this barrel down like this, and then he's letting it out to the ball. Well, I could never get this speed here and, and do that because I was pushing my barrel out to the ball instead of turning my barrel out to the ball, okay? Notice that this barrel remains perpendicular to his forearm for a long time. Forearm, barrel remains perpendicular to it, okay? That was another big thing to me because I had well, my arm's always coming down like this, and I'm pushing the barrel forward with my top hand like that. And yet, Manny's barrel, or bat, stays perpendicular to the forearm all the way around. Getting the owner over the green monster in Boston, 
Notice at the very beginning of his swing, until about right here, he still has this relationship, but the ball's way out there, and he goes like that and hits the ball over the green monster out the field. How does he get speed to do that? How does he get barrel speed to do that? Okay? It's like a, a flick of the wrist or something, and, and how does it go so far? So I'm studying all of this, trying to figure out how they, okay, I'm convinced that I've got to keep my barrel perpendicular to my forearm, but I'm not figuring out how to generate any bat speed with that. Albert and Agon and Ted and Mickey and all these guys. All these guys had a common theme. Even though they got there differently, they had a common load position and a common barrel path through their swing. Okay? Pool holes, if you can, you know, moves, the clip moves kind of fast, but can you see that that barrel stays perpendicular to his rear forearm almost all the way through the swing? Okay? He's got what I call the diagonal swing path. He comes through the zone like this. Yet Stanton is mostly horizontal. He comes through the zone like this. Okay, and that's what I was taught as a kid. Probably most of you were taught a level swing plane. That's a spinal axis. Okay, most people will tell you the body works its best from a spinal rotation standpoint. But none of those people have ever swung the bat like the pros did, okay? Um, the, the difference between what the greats do and what the almost greats do starts with the hand pivot point, the barrel pivoting around the rear forearm, okay? Now, also in this clip you can tell, if you look real close, Stanton swings from two legs, Albert swings from one leg. Now, clearly both legs are on the ground, so what am I saying? Watch Stanton, when he picks up his foot and moves forward, he shifts his weight to his front leg, then swings. Can you see that? Okay, watch Pools. He coils around his rear leg, and his front leg never gets weighted until the bat is swung. So it's like Pools like this. He coils like this, and he swings from there, and the act of swinging the bat is what weights his front leg. Okay, you see that? Here's Sammy. Strides out, gets the weight shift forward, swings around his spine. Who holds? I can never get his stance right, but I can get his upper body pretty good. Okay. Again, he's got the forearm axis, and he's doing it from one leg. One weighted leg. How do I know the weight is back? You've seen clips, maybe of Roberto Clemente, Stan Usual, Will Clark, tremendously large strides. Here's how you tell where the weight is. That's about as long a stride as I can do. That's about as long a stride as I can do. My weight is still back. I still got a load in this leg. I can't do anything from this position, don't get me wrong. But the way you know where the weight is, is what's going on right here. When they pull their scat back, they are arresting their forward momentum. They're keeping the load in their leg all the way, as long as they possibly can. So they've got their load here. If it's a fastball, they unload it. If it's a changeup, they just glide on a little more, and then they unload. But they do not let that weight shift until they swing the back. Pictures are pretty good. They'll get you to your front leg sometime before you want to. Took your hat to them, they got me. Yes? I've got a question you, you won't be able to answer. Uh, that Barry Bonds is his hit. We have a little battery left. Let's see if we stand. 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 Okay. So I touched on the hand pivot point and the one leggedness of the swing. I want to go into more of the one leggedness of the swing. this clip up a minute ago. It's just a still picture. But along with the hand pivot point, the, the concept of the hand pivot point, when I'm in my stance with the hand pivot point, I'm on the plane before I do a thing. And here's why. And this is what this video, this picture shows. I'm loaded, 
If the pitch is right there, I turn the barrel right there. It's my hands. I turn the barrel right there. If the pitch is down on this next ray down, the pitch is right there, I turn the barrel right there. If it's next, the next one down, the low one away, I turn the barrel right there. I'm doing the same thing. My barrel is turning around my rear forearm for each of these locations. Okay, low and in. That adjustability. You don't have to bend your spine or bend over or raise up or whatever. The swivel will swivel to the ball when you learn to do it right. Okay, that right there is everything in the swing. So, when you're in your stance, technically, you're on plane for whatever pitch comes. Okay? You turn the barrel wherever like this, and you can adjust it on the fly to that pitch, or that pitch, or that pitch without any other movement. And he has an up move, barrel tip up move, and until he launches, he's one-legged. And when he launches, the leg comes down, okay? Think about it. All these great hitters, if they had to plant their front leg first and then pull off their swing, does it even make logical sense to you? You got a pitcher throwing 95 and he's got an 84 change up and he's got slider moves everywhere. How in the heck can you get your front leg down on time? By on time, when you watch these guys' foot come down, their foot is coming down and waiting as they hit the ball, as they swing. I'm not talking about on time like real early so that it's down, so that I can be ready. I'm talking about when you watch the clips, that foot gets down the instant they swing the bat. Are they putting it down then swinging? How do you do that against 95 and the next pitch 85? I don't think it's possible. I think the swing is putting the foot down. And do you see, uh, or even talk about a lot of adjustment as far as holding that foot a longer for the off speed so that way you can Absolutely. Swing when you, when you get down. Um, I'll do my favorite Longoria imitation here. What's going on in this hip socket is huge. Okay, notice that as I'm moving out, I'm pulling back like this. And this movement arrests that forward momentum. This movement controls my move out. For every inch you move forward. Every unit I move forward, I gotta battle it with an inch pulling back, okay? Can you see that? I'm going back like this as I'm moving out. What most amateur hitters do is they'll load back first and then they'll move out. Can you see the difference in what happened in my leg? Load and move out, I land square. I never got any kind of hip opening. But if I pull back as I go out, what happens? I land open. You've got to land open because that's what you stretch against. Okay? This pulling back like this and landing like that, you've got to stretch up your back that will drive. Feel Adrian move out. As he moves out, how does that feel? Don't just look at it, feel it. It's just a, a little click back, little coil, move out as you go and he lands open like this, which is the stretch, which is the missing frames that Ron mentioned to, mentioned about. The missing frames that are absent in so many amateur hitters is the stretch. When I load here and then move out, nothing moved, nothing turned. But when I pull back and load, this leg turns down as I pull back, and then when I swing, Watch the two pivot points. This one's gonna go like this, and that one's gonna go like that. They're gonna go simultaneously, but what's really special is when you turn this barrel really fast, the weight and speed and direction of this barrel that way stresses this leg even more, and when that barrel gets flat, the amount of resistance going that way goes to zero, and that leg just whips you through the zone. It's like magic. These guys here, some of these guys are felt. So it's not a conscious open your hips, turn, turn, turn. You never open your hips. The only active part that initiates the swing is, is the switch. That's right. When you've got 
this stretch going on right here, I'll do the Longoria again. When you've got that kind of stretch going right here, the go move is this. Not bad for 62. Is that a <laughs> Not bad for 62. Is that a <laughs> By your elbow. I'm glad you said that because I forgot to mention the words. Not mentioned it. It's adduction of the upper arm. Adduction is bringing it to your body. Abduction is taking it away from your body. So you add up your forearm. At the same time, you supinate. I'm sorry, you add up your upper arm. At the same time, you supinate your forearm. Watch it in full speed or partial speed. This is the move right here. Okay, when you do that with stretch, the bat just explodes to the zone. If you don't have the stretch, it's not going to explode. Everything's important, every detail's important. But this is the trigger. And technically, the swing is over from an energy standpoint production right there. You've done everything you can do. You've stretched, you've lost the barrel there, and at that point, that leg just Fires you through. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of you here if you're going to touch on this, but when you're at max coil, the relationship between your femur and your your hips, does that change at all from there? Like, I know the, the, the whole assembly opens, is it's still IR the whole time? That's a good question. And I confused these guys earlier this week, so I'm going to talk about it. We're, well, actually, we're not quite into the stretch area yet. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Okay. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, That was a funny one. I'm a little ahead of myself. You have that golfer? Not ready to do the stretch. This is a high school coach in Kansas City who met me in Columbia, Missouri, and we didn't have a facility, so we just swung in the parking lot. <laughs> we're, high, we're a high class, high budget operation here. Okay? The one legged drill, which he's doing, is a great drill because obviously you don't have your lead leg to, to get in the way. You've got to learn to do it. And he's doing it wrong in this swing. He's going like this and pushing his arms forward, right? You see that? All right, that's just, that's no different than two legs doing the same thing. After I worked with him for a few minutes and I convinced him that he had to use his back instead of his chest, See the difference? Yeah. Maybe I can get them both to play. I don't know if they're both play or not. How does that feel? Oops. You can see it, I know. Sure. But how does it feel? On the left, on the right, a good swing. His hip socket, he's one-legged, and his hip socket is rotating like this around the ball of his femur. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. <clears throat> it's this. Okay? On the, on the left, he doesn't have any of that action at all. He has nothing like this going on. Instead, he's just standing there like this and pushing out of his hip. Okay, the relevance of this lift is huge that you'll understand as we go on long. <coughs> I'm going to demonstrate what he's doing with two legs, and that's this right here. I'm getting my rear hip socket to revolve around the ball of my rear femur. I first coil, and then I lateral tilt, and then I go like that, okay? And the power of that is from right here, which is the position all hitters get into, I can hit any ball in the zone. Okay, here I am. I can hit the low ball, low and away. Here I am again, <coughs> up and away. Here I am again. I can hit the up and in and keep it fair. Okay, and I can hit, hit the position again. I can hit the low and in and keep it fair. My swivel 
took me to all those locations, and it could do that because my hip can go to each location because I'm one legged. Boom for that one down there. Boom for that one up there. Boom for this one up here. And boom for that one down there. Now I want you to show me how your hips can do that from two legs. The only thing your hips can do from two legs is rotate and pull you off the ball. That's all they can do. They do provide some power, but two-legged hip rotation, when it's at its most powerful point, you're going that way, okay? So a two-legged hip rotation, ball's outside, you're gonna flare it to the opposite field. If it comes down the middle, you might hit it really well. If it comes inside, you're gonna hook up the foul and strike one. Your hip and leg has to be able to go through the ball to provide power into the ball, okay? If it's not doing that, you're not gonna be able to generate any, any pop. This drill, even the guys who work with me might look like that, okay? But this is what it has to feel like inside your swing. This is awesome. If I haven't convinced you yet, this should. Oh. This guy's a hell of a golfer. Yeah. I'm saying he's a pro. He's a hell of a golfer. How the hell does he do that? Okay? Well, tees on the ground. Not too bad, huh? He didn't fall over though, did he? Okay. What's going on in my hip socket to be able to do that? What's going on with my load? What's going on with the leg to be able to generate that kind of power? Okay? That proves one-leggedness to me. Now, baseball player, your tee's up here. Okay? It's not a bad swing for one leg, is it? Okay? Not again. I'm not selling you on standing one leg in the batter's box. What I'm selling you on is this feeling and how important that feeling is and how the hip socket and the leg works. With two legs, you'll never get your leg, your, your rear hip socket and your rear leg to work properly. Two legs, I think. So this wrench is, is one leg. This is the rear leg, the rear hip socket. Right. Working around the ball fever. Now I know the, the skeleton it, this would actually looks a little different something like this? Well, I use the word fall over the cliff a lot. Right. When I load up and want my hitter to laterally tilt their torso, I want them to fall over the back of that cliff. That's the river. That's an exaggeration, but look what happened when I do it full speed. You probably won't even be able to tell that I laterally tilt it. Well, you can tell. But what happens is, I get here, and I'm actually doing this, but when I do that, that snaps this leg around. I'll do it with the barrel so you can see that even though I'm laterally tilting my torso over the ball of the femur, the swing plane is not excessively uppercut. When a, when a coach tells you not to dip your rear shoulder because you're gonna pop balls up, anybody that swims with two legs in a spinal rotation, it's true. But anybody that swings from one leg with two pivot points stretched between each other, it's false. In fact, this move here <clears throat> is probably, along with this, this happens simultaneously. It's the launch of the swing, and that launch, that direction, tightens the stretch in the leg and makes your swing even more explosive through the zone, okay? Even though you're laterally tilting your torso like this, you're not going to be swinging up in the air like you, like you might think you This one is this one's great too. <laughs> Hitting a forearm. What does that feel like in the rear leg? I've never played much tennis, but he's standing here open. He's not standing like a batter's box. Uh, batter's box. He's standing here open and he gets this stretch. His hip coils against his leg. The leg resists that coil. The leg wants to go this way when the hip's going that way. And that racket just puts through the zone. From one leg, he can create that stretch around his rear leg, 
with his hip and back muscles, and that's exactly what you have to do in the bench legs. You have to create that kind of stretch to create the sudden snappy launch that you need to hit. I have a stretch and fire drill. This is my son, my guinea pig. Okay? We spent a lot of time together. We hated each other at times. <laughs> we loved each other at times. And I'm going to tell you, when he got this swing and he hit a ball in a gap and slid into second base, the first thing he did is look for my eyes in the crowd, and that's powerful. Okay? Because this, could, this kid couldn't hit a ball off a tee as a freshman in high school. <laughs> this is what I call the stretch and fire drill. <coughs> Pitcher's over there, and you stand facing him. You learn to create that same stretch that I just showed you with Rafael Nadal. And instead of swinging a, a, a tennis racket, you swing the bat through the zone. Okay? You can't get a more snappier launch than that. I'm not saying he's the greatest athlete you've ever seen. I'm saying that technique. You can't get any snappier technique than that. When you load around this rear leg like this, and then launch your barrel rearward, send that barrel this direction, tightens that stretch even more, and that bat just whips through the zone. Okay. It's the mechanical advantage of the high-level swing. It provides effortless power. See this weekend. It's excellent. Oh yeah, this is awesome. The kid on the right, his hips are turning in a mostly horizontal plane, and his upper body swings in a mostly horizontal plane. He has no stretch. Okay, that's what Sam's doing. Hips are rotating like this, swing planes like that. It's, the hips aren't doing anything but providing momentum. They're not really pulling anything. They're just providing momentum. And he swings with his upper body in a mostly horizontal plane. On the left, this is a huge exaggeration, but it's exaggerated for a purpose because that's what you try to do, even though your body can't do that. The blue line, his hips are coming around like this, and the vertical plane, he's trying to launch the barrel behind him, okay? Now what is behind? Barrel behind him, okay? Now what is behind? Behind is determined by your handset. If I'm Manny, and my hands are here, behind is right there, perpendicular to my forearm, okay? If I'm Barry, and I'm tipping the bat like this, behind is more here, perpendicular to my forearm. If I'm Albert, and I'm standing here like this, perpendicular to my forearm is more like that. Perpendicular forearm is, determines what is back and what is forward. And that's all determined by your handset, okay? You guys stand in all kinds of different ways. So, this vertical, completely vertical disc, it is an exaggeration, but it's done that so you can understand that it's a completely different direction than the horizontal disc, okay? And that vertical disc, in reality, depends on your handset how you stand. But in all cases, it's perpendicular to the forearm, okay? So when I'm standing here in the zone, or in the batter's box, I'm gonna launch, I'm gonna launch like this, okay? If I'm Barry, Okay, I'm going to launch this way, but this plane, this disc here, compared to this disc here, as they go against each other, they create a stretch between them. It's one of the words I use is torsion spring. The torsion spring, I didn't put on top of Albert there. The bottom little trigger, the bottom little lever of the torsion spring is his coil against his leg. This is big. When you coil, so many people don't coil properly. And the key to a good coil is when you coil, this foot has to feel like it wants to snap back like that. It won't because you're waiting on it. But it's gotta have tremendous pressure right here on your toes, outside of your foot, okay? If you don't have that kind of pressure, you don't have any coil that's worth anything. Coil, 
my foot wants to snap like that if I unweave it. Okay? This right here is the bottom of that torsion spring. Okay? Notice that I can do that without much shoulder movement. My foot wants to snap really bad right now. My shoulders haven't moved at all because I'm turning my, just my pelvis around the rear leg. I'm not turning the pelvis around the spine from two legs. I'm turning the pelvis around the rear leg. It pivots in the rear hip socket and it puts tremendous pressure on my foot at the ground. What percent of your weight is on your back foot right there? How much? What percent of your weight is on your back foot? <laughs> These Roughly. guys asked me this yesterday. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about feel and I'm going to talk about video. Okay. From feel, it feels like every bit of my weight. Really? Uh -huh. From video, clearly my front foot is on the ground and clearly right. it's providing yeah. a little balance for yeah. me. I'm not standing here like this. In fact, I can't even create that kind of load without my front leg on the ground. But from feel, it feels like everything is here. Lift your foot easily right in front of that position. What? For, lift your front foot now. You want me to show them the spring? Is that what you want to do? Here's what the feeling you would like to aspire to. Coil into that leg, lift that front leg, and you spring over. Oh, wow. I never saw that. That's good. Okay? You know you got a good coil when your leg works like that. Coil into it, lift that leg. I'm not moving me. I'm not doing anything extra to get me to move. I am coiling to this leg so strong that this leg is fighting it by wanting to go that way. Now I confused my hitters earlier this week. I told them you coil your hip against the internal rotation of the leg. And so they're trying to do both. They're trying to turn their leg and coil their hip. <laughs> and they stand there like they got no spring. Okay? My words were not specific enough. The coil against the foot is everything. Once you're coiled, the leg reacts to it. It's not two separate moves that you try to create at the same time. That makes sense? Because when you try to coil and in turn rotate your leg at the same time, you, you just don't get anywhere, okay? So the strong move is the coil against the leg, putting pressure, keeping your knee as straight as you can. You don't want your knee to go back like that. Keeping your knee straight, putting as much pressure on that foot as you can so that when you lift your foot, you spring open. Okay? So, now, so, I'm sorry, so you're, you're not, your foot is naturally going back like that. It what? You're, when you lift that foot, that's just natural. You're not doing that, you're not doing any muscular movement to get that foot. See my that, spring again? Well, I mean, I it looks like a magic you're talking about muscle. My foot or my spring? Yeah. Oh, now, when you lift that foot, you're not doing any, you're just letting, you're just letting your muscles relax. Yeah, watch how fast I can spring if I really coil. Okay. okay? That's, that's, yeah, no, I've never seen that, that before. That's awesome. Now that's too much coil for a swing, but this one's not too much. Right? And I spring open this, spring open now, can this. You do it with no, now, can coil? you do it with no coil? What? Just lift your foot, you know, just do like a normal, like 95% of the hitters do. Well, you know, with no coil there. And lift your no leg. No coil? Yeah, and lift your leg. <laughs> nothing happens. See, nothing happens. Right. You got no coil, nothing happens. Now, what's significant about that? Anybody that's played a little ball, how many times have you been right here? File that ball right straight back to the screen. You're just a tick late, right? What if this what if this leg uncoil is instant and you don't have to worry about it? It's gonna take a pretty good picture for you to miss that ball. Okay? Because in your old swing you had to generate movement. In your new swing, it's like stepping on the people who were at the airport. It's instant. You're not doing it. What I mean you kind of did it, you created the load that resulted in it. But when I'm here and I go to swing and my leg instantly turns open and I don't have to turn it open myself, it's huge. We're talking about, as the slide said, 30th of a second. A good swing, high level swing, 30 frames per second video. A good swing is between four and five frames of video. Okay? So we're talking four thirtieths, which is what, two fifteenths of a second for a good swing to be pulled off. And that's what I'm talking about from go, not, not including the load. So if at 2 fifteenths of a second you were a tad late because you were having to generate some movement on your own consciously, how much quicker are you when that movement happens instantly without conscious thought because of the loading that you've done? The testimony of what you're saying is when they got 34 years old, swear are tapping up because now it's not just as easy as playable. Okay. 
That's the bottom of that torsion spring. This is the bottom of that torsion spring. The top of the torsion spring is up here in your back and your scap. And this gets a little confusing at times. You pinch your scap to your spine or you clamp it down. You can't have a floppy arm and a floppy scap. If you want this energy here of this leg to get to your barrel, it passes through the scap spine junction. And if your scap spine junction is not clamped down tight or pinched or whatever the right word is, the energy from your leg dissipates right out that joint and never gets to your barrel. Okay? If you want that to get to your barrel, you, you get your bottom of your torsion spring, and then you get the top of your torsion spring. What did I do there? Watch my scan. Bottom, top. Can you see that? It's not a big movement. I didn't move my arms at all. Okay? I just tighten it up. Jonas from uh, Johns Hopkins yesterday, he used the word uh, set up your back. I thought that was a good, a good tip, a good word. It's not a load. You hear a lot of people talk about loading your scan. I hate the word scap load because they load unload, right? We don't want the scap to unload. We don't want the hip to unload. When our hip coils like this and we pinch our scap back like this, we've got a spiral load up the rear side of our body, putting pressure on our foot at the ground. And if we let this happen, which is the hip unloading, or if we let this happen, which is the scap unloading, we've just given up all that we earned. We got nothing from our rear leg right now. Okay, okay. So it's not a load that unloads. It's a coil that stays coiled. It's a clamp or a pinch that stays clamped. And when I do this, I come all the way through here and neither of them have unloaded yet. You say, well, wait, your hip is turned. What turned my hip? My hip is still here, but my leg turned. My hip coiled and it became a fused unit with my leg. It's now a unit, it's a hip leg. It's not a hip and a leg, it's a hip leg, okay? When I maintain that coil and my leg turns me like this, I'm still coiled, but now I'm facing this way. When I pinch my scap or hold my scap here and turn, I'm still pinched, but I'm facing that way. You've gotta keep those things tight or you're gonna give up what you earn in your leg, okay? Probably can't see that when I swing, but the suddenness of my launch is very, very much tied to this foot right here, and I can't get that foot to my scap, to my barrel, if I get weak here, or if I get weak in my scap, it won't get there. It'll dissipate throughout your body and you'll end up pushing the barrel with your hands. That's the importance of the torsion spring. Richard, is there a natural place to take a break? Here's the two pivot points with stretch between them. The the vertical gear on the, I guess on the right side there, is this. It's the lateral tilt and the turning of the barrel. Okay? The bottom gear is your coil and then your, your leg turning you forward like this. Okay? This is the bottom gear. This is the top gear. When I put them two together, you get a sudden snap out of them. This one going this way, and this one turning this way, you've got your two pivot points working at the same time but against each other. This one's creating energy that way, this one's creating energy that way, and it's like pulling your rubber band apart and snapping it, okay? And it's huge. It's, it, the, the, the launch of the swing is a sudden, instant. If I can't do anything for you more this weekend, but convince you that you have to be as quick as you can be to swing, then I've helped you a lot. You have to be as quick as if you're playing pinball and you push that button and that flipper flips. It's instantaneous, right? It happens instantaneously. When I'm in my stance and ready to swing and I decide to swing, boom, it has to go. If not, the pitch is gonna eat me up. I can't, have, I can't be here waiting for the ball and then decide to swing and then do something and swing. I have to have all that done already. All that's gotta be out of the way. So how do you do that? The only way you can do that is stretch yourself. You can't stand, you, you can't stand back here completely loaded 
like a statue, and then swing your back. You've done a lot of things right, but you didn't stretch. You didn't create this kind of stretch. You were all armed. I was all armed on that. There is no load in the swing. There's just loading. It's continuous. Okay? It's continuous. You don't load, stop, swing. It's continuous. And it's continuous, Ron had on his slideshow, around. Okay? So many hitters load back like this, hold it, and all they can do is push forward. Load back, hold it, push forward. The great hitters pull back and just keep going around. Okay? And that's a stretching process. Can you see the difference? Hold it, push it. I kept pulling back and then I just kept going around. Okay? I'm pulling back with my hip against my leg, my back up into my scalp, and I just let it come on around. I don't come back here, stop, and then redirect forward. I come back here, I keep pulling around, and I just go on around. And that stretches my leg, whips the barrel to the zone. Can, can you check swing? What? A check swing with your method. Check swing. Okay. You start the barrel around, you can still pull it up. How am I going to check this swing if I've already launched it? It's impossible. The stretch process, when you stretch and go to swing and then check it, you just kind of go limp in your body and you, and you dissipate the stretch and the barrel doesn't snap through the zone, okay? Instead of letting it go on through, you kind of do the same thing and then you just kind of, kind of hard to explain, you just kind of go limp. Here's all, you can check your swing. Ryan's finished his first year in Class A ball this year. He went to a scholarship at San Diego University. Played with Chris Bryant, I believe his first year. Chris is two or three years older than him. This is a Happy Gilmore drill. It's a great drill. I want you to feel what it feels like in his rear hip socket. Clearly, he's one-legged for the vast majority of that clip. And clearly, in my opinion, his leg doesn't, his lead leg doesn't straighten until it snaps, which is long after the launch. Okay? The launch shifts his weight. Giancarlo shifts his weight, then swings. The weight shift is not part of his swing. Albert shifts as he swings. The weight shift is part of his swing. It's within the swing, not before the swing. Okay? And that's what this clip here represents. The, the, he's able to create the stretch by stepping behind, and then right here, as he tips his barrel and pulls back like this, leg resists that and starts to turn him open and then he can snap the barrel through the zone. Understand the happy Gilmore. He's creating the stretch with that drill. The timing of the tip is important. Okay? I didn't have a Gilmore, I just showed the timing of the tip. Now here's the happy Gilmore. Ryan on the left gets the stretch. The girl on the right does it. Can you see it? The girl on the right has no pullback. I call this the pullback. She has no pullback against her move out to get her to land like this. If she has any pullback at all, which I don't think she does, she just stands here like this and does the happy Gilmore like that. She's got no stretch. She didn't create any stretch. If you're going to work on the happy Gilmore, by the way, the happy Gilmore produced this player. I mean, that's what he did every day, all day, from the time he was 12 until he went off to college. If you're going to do it, do it right. You're not getting anything out of the drill doing it wrong. No, the lateral tilt, does that assist with the pullback as well? Or, or do you think it's just it, more of getting hit behind the rear leg? Um, you coil in your leg, and then as you remain coiling, yep. you lateral tilt. Is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, I'm asking the lateral tilt. What's its main purpose? Would you say it's keeps about the getting stretch. the hit? It keeps, keeps the stretch. stretch and links it together. For, for yeah. If I coil like this and then swing forward instead of rearward, yep. I'm going to push my barrel. I'm not using the stretch. But if I coil and then launch this way with this action here, 
the stretch just it enhances. It just gets tighter and tighter. And the, and the leg just drives the barrel through the ball. Okay? The lateral, you coil your, your body, and then you lateral tilt over the back of your ball and your femur to launch the swing. So that's a, the function is it gets your hip behind your rear leg. Yeah, you and links all the way up to the scout. Yeah. Like links everything. Yep. Okay. There's several elements of the stretch. We've got some better clips coming out here to make it concise. There's two pivot points, the hand pivot point and the rear leg pivot point. And now we've got to learn to stretch them against each other to make a snap, a sudden snap of our swing. And he only hits like upper 200s, 280, 290, whatever. Hit 30 bombs last year, I think, or the year before. He's a great hitter. But the Cardinals batting leadoff, and they want him taking strikes. And he's always in two strike counts. And he's a great two strike hitter. Okay? So as a team player, he's doing what the Cardinals want to do. My theory is if he would not get in two strike counts so often, he'd hit 330. He's a great hitter. His mechanics are special. Okay? That's my theory. Okay, I just want to look at it here, and then uh, Gonzalez also. Is when you talk about a foot stride, you want to make sure your foot stride is like what your hips, his hips are still in that internal rotation. Um, is he still internal forward. rotation of the hip? Oh, is he's coiled. Still coiled? Yes. But it's, I would call it more external. But okay. the leg is internal. Yeah. But it's, it's the foot strike is open instead of being neutral or closed. You want that to create that stretch. Well, uh, first I'll say I never look at my front foot. But okay. let's see what happens. I'm okay with that. Okay. Barry Bonds landed closed with his front foot, but he had this right here. It's awkward for me to do that. It feels awkward. A lot of players, I, you will never hear me say much about the front foot and the back foot because it doesn't define what they're doing. I can show you 600 and some home runs from Jim Tomey, and his back foot never did any more than that. I can show you 500 home runs from uh, Albert had 500. He has 500. Yeah. From Albert, and oftentimes his foot comes forward like that. They're both doing the same thing under the Why the difference has to do with their stance, their hand set, their setup, the amount of forward momentum they use. All those different things come into play. And it's the same thing with the front foot. Like for every hitter that I show that you think is great that lands closed with his front foot, I can show you one that lands open with his front foot. So therefore, I don't think that's an important part of the swing because I can show you great hitters doing both and anything in between. If you look at that carpenter's foot foot though, the swing kind of forces it open from the momentum. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it kind of goes, goes like that. Goes because he's, he's putting so much force into yeah. it. That also has to indicate somewhat that there's not a whole lot of weight on that foot yeah. prior, prior to the swing. You say he's putting so much force into it. I mean, he's just creating so much torque with his body that it's, right. it's yeah. torquing his front foot over. Can you, um, I know with me, like, when I first learned from you, like, the first day, I honestly didn't get anything until we were at dinner. That's mm -hmm. what I, that, that was my... I could tell at dinner. But, um, uh -huh. can you demonstrate a hip coil? I think that that'll help a lot of these yeah. people. Because, like, I think that they're kind of looking at the feet more, but it's really a lot of your back hip. Well, if you're looking from here to here, and then what I do up here, you're going to learn to swing. If you're looking down there, you're going to be lost, okay? But I'm going to get into that stuff, Nick. I'm going to get into that I think... We, you know, we were always taught the ground forces come from your front leg, and when the ground forces are from the rear, it's completely from the rear leg. The, the swing is like you're driving down the road in your car 70 miles an hour, and your front end hits the telephone pole. Your front end, that's your, that's your front leg. What does it do? It forces the ass end of that car to swing around, right? And your front leg, when you, when you swing into your front leg, instead of just falling forward, it's going to cause you to come through the zone, okay? It's all the front leg does, and it's it's a block, but it's not a push back like some people. Think. So as I as I've instructed over the years, I develop terms that say the same thing, or they mean the same thing, but they're different words. And some of you may have heard it this way, and some of you may have heard it that way. It's the same thing. If you have a question about something I've said to you before that I haven't brought up today, don't be afraid because it is it is part of the swing. Torsion spring, I talk about it a lot. Um, I'll also talk about the slingshot, how you pull back against that leg and it slingshots you through, or the bow and arrow, kind of the same thing. I call it a rag ring. This load against your leg, when you go like this, and your leg wants to go like that, it's kind of like you're ringing a rag. You know what I'm saying? 
And so there's a lot of terms that I, I have developed that maybe I haven't used every one of them today. And if, and if you have a question about them, let me know. But I'm going to go into some before and after stuff now. This little girl's dad joined my site. Yeah, maybe. Here we go. And this was the swing he sent me first. You know, a little nine-year-old girl, you say, oh, how sweet it is, but that swing sucks. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just not very good. All right? I spent, on my side, I never worked with this girl myself. I just spent a couple of, uh, I don't know, a couple of days maybe, on the site, showed him the Happy Gilmore girl, or Happy Gilmore drill, and this is her doing the drill. That's pretty special right there for a nine-year-old girl. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Really <laughs> special swing. Okay? It's a drill. Step behind, stretch behind your leg, turning the barrel. Okay? And this is the... Uh, I don't have a full swing, but I have two parts of the swing. I couldn't find the full swing. Full swing. This is her launch. But this is her launch. Her, her load, I guess, just prior to her launch. Notice you can feel her stretch against her leg. She loses her rear knee a little bit, kind of goes back toward the catcher. And uh, there are some big leaders who do that. I prefer not to see it. But this load, she's all ready to go. And this is the resulting barrel path that comes out of that swing, which is pretty special. She's got the depth of the barrel. Her rear leg is pulling, not pushing. She's turning the barrel with her forearms. And, uh, and she's nine at the time. She might be 11 or, 11 or so now. And the last I heard from her dad is she's hitting the ball farther than anybody in her league. Okay? So that's a before and after. Um, this gentleman is present. He's in our presence. Never worked with him in person, but he's been on our site for quite a while. On the left is not good. Okay, as you can see, he loses his rear. He might coil a little bit, but he loses his rear leg load as he moves forward. He shifts his weight, then he swings on the left. But on the right, notice how he keeps that rear leg loaded the entire time. The, the weight stays back. He shifts at launch. The, ball, the, the body weight unloads into the launch of the ball. And watch the rear leg snap through. You can hardly even see it. It, it goes from face, the knee goes from face of the camera to face the pitch instantly. Okay? And what put this swing together for you at the end? Um, at max stretch, launch the barrel. Like I was letting my weight come across my pelvis. And yep. I said, you know, launch, okay. don't, don't get forward. Launch while you're back, stay on the bar stool. Everybody thinks they're back, but they aren't. You know, you thought you were back on the left, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Didn't you? yeah. There's, a, there's a position that he gets to here that he doesn't get to here, and I'm going to try to demonstrate it for you. And I just talked to Jason about it. It's it's like the position, and I call it the hip slip. When you call in your leg and start to move out, right there, right there, right there. Can you can you see what I'm pointing out? Where the leg starts to turn forward, and my hip socket is kind of falling back over. The ball of the femur. Every one of you, if you learn to get to this position, you'll reach your potential. Absolutely. Right there. From this position, I can hit any ball. And also from that position, I can carry it a little longer if I need to for the off speed. It's all total rear leg control. Okay? If you're striding with your front leg, you're not achieving that position. You have, no, you have no load in your rear leg. You have no uh, ability to create a what I call the deep whoosh, the, the barrel speed behind you. But right there, right there. So, why do you call it a slip? Why hip do you, slip? Yeah, why do you call it a slip, hip well, slip? because I can physically feel <laughs> my hip socket going like that over the ball of my finger. It slips do, over do, the do that again? Uh, oh, oh the, the hip socket the slipping hip socket over the ball of the femur. It okay. slips right there. It slips over the back of the ball of the femur, and the leg starts to turn forward, and that's the ultimate stretch right there. 
Okay, right there. In the Longoria clip, it was like this. Okay, when I start to, when my center of gravity starts to lower, right there, my hip is slipping over the back of my ball and my femur. And I've told these gentlemen that we're working out this week, you can forget about the swing all you want if you learn to do this, because the swing is automatic from this position. You know, that's, you know, the reading is automatic a lot. from this position. You know, that's, you know, reading a lot, you know, what you do, sometimes a lot of people, the hips, when people talk about hips, they're talking like a whole unit, a fused unit. Mm -hmm. would, it, would it be inaccurate if you said the hip socket slip? Hip socket slip, the rear hip socket slip. Is that? But, That's more specific. Yeah, that might be better when you're trying to, you know, hip, you know, to get it, convey it. The hip, the pelvis the is hip a full bone. Slip. It doesn't, it's not several bone, it's a full Right, unit. it's huge, yeah. So when, when it goes right there, the entire pelvis is pivoting back like this a little bit. Right. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, from that position right here, this should be your goal. Whatever the pitcher's wind up is or a stretch or whatever, at least by here, maybe a little later, maybe a little earlier, depending on how old you are and how quick you are. If you make the goal to get right there on time, you will hit, you will hit. There's no pitch you can't hit from there. There's no speed you can't handle from there. There's no off speed you can't handle there with practice. There's no movement you can't handle from there. Okay, that's pretty strong talk, right? Yes, it is. Some of these pictures have pretty good. Yes, some of these pictures have pretty good movement, <laughs> but you got no chance handling in any other technique. Is the point? Okay. You may not if if uh, when you get to here and you thought the ball was going over there and it starts moving in here, boom! You can still launch instantly. That's the key. I don't know if I said it enough. But we, what, what, what I am talking about is the time between your decision to swing and the actual launch of your swing. You hear everybody talk about exit velocity and bat speed and, and the time between launch and contact. No, that, all that's good stuff. But what's really special is when your swing is instantaneous between your decision to swing and the launch of your swing. If you have to reset your hands or you have to do some, some kind of movement in between your decision to swing and the launch of your swing, at some level, you're going to get eaten up by the pitching. You can't deal with it. You can't have, I call it slop, slop in the swing. If you're right here ready to swing and when you swing, you got to do something like this, you're done. Pitcher's going to notice that and he's going to eat you up. Okay? If you're here like this and you're ready to swing and you got to go like that to swing, you're done. You don't have time for that crap. Okay? You've got to be, whether you stride or no stride, You've got to be right there, right at the hip slip spot, right there, on time, and you can handle anything that comes to you, okay, with practice. Right? Um, on the right, just in a nutshell, if I can shorten it up, coil in your hip to where your leg is really stressed, pinch your scap so that whatever comes out of the leg comes up through the scap, lateral tilt more than you ever thought you needed to. Yeah, don't think about the lateral tilt. That's away from the second base. Huh? Yeah, away. No, that's good. Let, watch me. When I call out, where are my shoulders? If my pitcher's there, where are my shoulders? Toward, uh, Toward the shortstop a little bit, right? The lateral tilt is the exact reverse of that. I want if I'm laterally or if I'm coiled so my shoulders are there, my lateral tilt is this. It's strong. It's more than you think you should. Okay. So I come around like this, and as soon as I do that, my leg turns me, and that's why you don't see it in video. Because you see the turn, and even the lateral tilt may be only this big, and you're looking at the shoulders. The shoulders may only look this big, but by feel, it was huge. It was a huge feeling. Like I could fall over that way if my, if my body wouldn't save me, okay? So stress your leg, get your scap where it's scap, where it's the scap, and the scap is just a little pinching move. It's not a big, Back like that, you don't want your arm to move much. You definitely don't want your arm to do the pinching, okay? Now some players, you see their arm go back, but they're taking it back with their scap, okay? So here I am, I'm coiled, I'm pinched, I'm, I've got a spiral load all the way up as far as I can go. And what my body wants to do is that. I've eliminated my arms, and that's huge. You gotta get the feeling where your arms are not part of the swing, that this is the movement, and when you do this, with that, the bat snaps through the zone. The lateral tilt is, is 
100% rearward. You're not continuing lateral tilt as you turn. The lateral tilt is over right there. But then the leg turns to knock back towards the catcher. I said that's right. what I told Matt. He said, I thought lateral tilt meant catcher to the catcher was. Instead away from the. Yeah, I just figured that. Think away way. from the opposite middle fielder. And when you coil it, you've got to have two eyes in the pitcher. If you can't get a good toil, a coil without, and you lose your eyes while doing that, you've got to, you've got to work on that. You're probably coiling like this instead of coiling like that. Okay, this is just a small move. It shouldn't have to move your shoulders. It continues around when you lift your leg. Yeah. What's that? The coil continues when you lift your leg. This coil, or when I lift this coil. leg. Yeah. Yep. See that? I'm, I'm as I'm as coiled as I can be, but when I lift my leg, I'm going to go like that to make sure it's set, it's tight. And then watch, watch this leg when I do that. This leg turns forward right there. As soon as you see this action here with the, the I want to say the hips are open, but technically the hip is still coiled and the leg has turned it. That's critical, okay? But for discussion, I'm gonna say my hip leg is open and I'm stretched back here. And that's where the power comes So, so again, you're, 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 as you're moving out, you're, you're taking a ground. Out back, around. back, yes. And it's more around. Right. It's more around like this than it is back like that. Right. Okay? All right? So, so, if, if you're ever on Twitter and you see me argue with someone that the hips don't rotate, what do I mean? I mean exactly that. The hip coils and it stays in a state of coil the entire swing until the, the swing happens. Okay? If you're getting into a state of coil and then uncoiling your hips, you're going to push your rear arm. You're not going to have any stretch. None of this is going to work. But the hip but coils and the leg and the hip becomes a unit. It's like fused together at this point. And now the leg is everything. The leg is everything. Okay? Yep. One more thing on the lateral tilt. You said tilt with in line with your shoulders. In line, so pretty much in line with your shoulders, from, shoulders. from the opposite middle in front. So like if your shoulders are facing the shortstop, you would tilt exactly that way. Or or less field, you would tilt. Well, I don't know if you're going to be close. I guess you might with an open stance. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a place, Richard, for uh, somebody who's just beginning to work into this to start? This may be better than another place. I mean, should you start? Where do I start with somebody? You know, I, well, no. I mean, as far as load goes and the schedule and all. I mean, how am I if I'm asking the question right? I know. I just know that those guys just guys told me. Start into the scat load earlier or reset the load. Preset. preset as you're learning. I highly recommend you preset maybe even 100% of everything and then lateral tilt and get the feeling of it. And that'll keep you encouraged because you'll feel the stamp. Because you and I talked about Bonds or, or, or Davis. Yeah. You know, After you get real good at it, go. Barry Bonds could stand like this and instantly be in the position because he's done it all his life. As you learn the new technique, time. I recommend darn your, darn your 100%, if not 80%, and then you get the last little bit. You know, if you, uh, we're, we'll do some command drills, and the, the command drill is when you get into a fully loaded position, and you wait for someone to say go, and you swing on command. Well, the beauty of that drill is, it teaches you where you have to be to be able to swing on command. And what most people will do is they'll be here and they'll hear the command and then they'll go like this. Then they'll load the swing. And this you got no chance. You have to you have to learn where the loaded launch position is so that on command you just go. Jose, they all have this engine right here underneath whatever they do. Whatever stand they stand from, whatever handset they stand from, this are these are the missing frames right here. Okay? The missing frames is this position of stretch. And then when this goes this way, this goes this way. And if you watch all the swings you ever see uh, on Twitter or wherever you're watching swings, you're not going to see very many have that right there. What's the seamless overlap? Seamless overlap is kind of the same thing as the missing swing or missing frames. When I coil back like this and I continue on around, it's hard to determine where the actual launch was sometimes. Uh -huh. Right. But if I, and therefore it's a seamless overlap. But if I coil back like this and hold it, and then push forward, it's really easy to determine what was loaded and what was launched.
okay? So if I'm gonna do here, get to the hip slip position, it's kinda hard to do with slow motion, but that's a swing, hit my hip slip, and then I hit a fastball, okay? Then, the next pitch is a change at my hip slips, and I just carried it out a second or a tick longer. It's the same swing, I still swung around the load. The load went this way, but so did the swing. The load started around the circle, and so did the swing finished the circle. That's the seamless over. And that's allowing you in that zone much longer than, mm -hmm. than quickly actually. You know, and, and, and so that you can have a time here and still, yeah. still score the ball. Yeah. You guys ready to hit? Put the pressure in. I put the camera on yesterday and it broke down. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, guys, in my office here, back from 10 days on the road, I've got something important to show you. Um, several kids were pushing with their top hand, and no matter how I asked them to swivel, they wouldn't swivel. Um, as soon as they got a ball in front of them, whether it was a tee or a push, or I'm sorry, a tee or a toss, they would attempt to apply force into the ball. No, we do not apply force into the ball. We apply force into our handle, into the handle of the bat. And the bat is swiveled rearward into what I call autopilot. It creates an arc. The barrel is speeding around the arc, and then it hits the ball. And the only force we apply is into the handle to create this arc. So I had kids struggling to do that, so here's what I did. I had them get into a reverse top hand situation and take cuts where it's kind of like an oar lock. Your bottom hand is pulling against this top hand to create the arc of the barrel behind them and then get them to obviously release the top hand because that's all you can do from there and allow the barrel to come around to the ball with great force, force that was created right here, not into the ball. And instantly they had a feeling for what autopilot was. Then I took it a step further and said, open your top hand and do the same thing with your top hand in a normal position, but open. And still pull the oarlock against the resistance of that thumb and the same exact arc of the barrel occurred and it whipped down into the ball. They were no longer applying force into the ball, they were applying force into their handle and then the barrel came around to the ball. So then all you have to do close your top hand, still do the same thing against your thumb, and you will create a whip behind you that automatically eliminates pushing of the barrel, okay? Of course, all the other stuff's important. You get one-legged, you get a stretch and fire load around your leg, but what I have always demonstrated as my swivel is basically the same thing as the oar lock. When I swivel, the pressure that I create to send my barrel rearward is against my thumb. It's not my fingers pulling it over as much as it's my thumb creating the pressure to send that barrel, to swivel that barrel rearward. And of course my top hand pronates and helps, helps that along. So I wanted to send this video to you guys, especially you guys with young kids. This was an instant change for several of the hitters in Wisconsin. Thanks for your